Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the services of the Monticello Church of Christ. It is February the 28th, the last Sunday in February 2021. The order of our worship this morning, at the conclusion of the announcements, uh, Brother Curtis Harris will word the opening prayer. Uh, Brother Dale Reagan will uh, word the prayers for the Lord's Supper this morning. Uh, Brother Jacob Jordan uh, will be here uh, today and next Sunday to bring us the lesson. And at the close this morning, uh, Brother Shannon Carter will word the closing prayer. In our prayer list this morning, uh, our church family, Dennis and Charlotte Walker, Mary Weston, Brenda Reagan, Betty Markham, and uh, Linda Van Hook. I'll say some more about some of those in just a second. Uh, others that we make mention of every week, family and friends, uh, Mary Burke, Jeff Parmley, Gladys Dennis, Frank and Teresa Davis, Rowena Branscombe, Sandy Montgomery, Bill Harris, Glenna Tucker, Alan Frost, Wanda Markham, Vicki Rankin, Mary Kuntz, Donald Sloan, Gary Abbott, Tanner San Juan, Glendale Perkins, Elizabeth Carol Miller, Oakley Crabtree Sr., Tim Piles, Addison Morrow, Emily Crabtree, and Kelly Jones. Those that are serving in the military, uh, Chris White, Austin Crabtree, John Frost, and Samuel Sanoa. Sister Betty Markham, I uh, think like we announced last week, she did fall and break her wrist, and she had an appointment this past Monday at uh, Glasgow, and uh, I guess good news, if there is any good news, is that she did not have to have surgery, but she ended up with a cast that I think she has to wear for uh, six weeks or so, so continue to remember Betty in your prayers. Uh, Emily Crabtree, uh, who is June Uncle's mother, uh, she also fell, and but she broke her hip, but she has been released from the from the hospital after replacement hip surgery, and she's now in Golden Years uh, Nursing Home for rehabilitation. So uh, continue to remember her in June in your prayers, and June wants to thank everyone for, for the prayers. Remember, we announced last week Kelly Jones, who's the daughter of Jim and Pat Norick, and she's uh, still having difficulty recovering from, uh, from the virus, from COVID. Continue to remember Brenda Reagan, with, uh, she continues to struggle with health issues also. And one other one, uh, Linda Van Hook, uh, Angie Blevins' mother, you know, she's in Wayne County Hospital and she's had COVID and having a hard time getting over it. And uh, uh, on, on Friday, talking to her, she was, she felt like she was getting better and would be in the hospital just a few more days. So. Continue to remember all of these people uh, in your prayers. Uh, send them a card, call them, text them, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with, and hopefully that will brighten their day, cheer them up a little bit. We've been doing this worship service virtually uh, for a year or so, and uh, uh, hopefully things are changing quickly. And uh, I want to throw out a date for us to maybe possibly try to get back to our in-house worship service. And, uh, the first, if you look ahead at your calendar, the first Sunday in April, uh, about a month from now, the first Sunday in April will be Easter Sunday. And I think that would be a good day for us to shoot for, to, to, get, to get back to, to our uh, regular worship service on Sunday morning like we've been used to for all the years. So keep that date in mind, and uh, we will talk about it in a couple more weeks. And Hopefully by then, all of our people who are 60 and older will have received a couple of shots for the virus and, uh, and, and maybe others also. But uh, hopefully by April, uh, whatever, I forgot what date that is, but it's the first Sunday in April. But uh, hopefully we can get together, get back together on Sunday morning, beginning on that day. And again, I say we'll talk about that day later. So uh, these, this is all the announcements that I have this morning, and uh, we will could begin our worship service this morning with Brother Curtis Harris leading us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this first day of the week. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the spiritual blessings we have that we can enjoy on this day, the opportunity we have to assemble. Uh, we're thankful also, Heavenly Father, for the material things that you provide for us in this life. and. 
we pray that you'll help us to always appreciate these things and realize that you are the source of these blessings. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with those of our number who are sick at this time, if it be your will that they might be restored back to their health. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with one who brings the message today. Help him to be able to easily remember things he's prepared. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll watch over and care for us through this life, that you'll forgive us our sins, and we pray that in the end we might be a, have a home in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, there's a song we usually sing. I'm going to read the words to it. It's uh, called, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, and Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave you weary and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, and Jesus is very near. Troubled souls and Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, and Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, and Jesus is very near. As we give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for the bread. To Christians, it reminds us of Jesus' body where he was on the cross and suffered and gave his life for our sins. Help us to appreciate this and do so in a way that will be pleasing to you as we partake. We pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Father, we're thankful to you for the fruit of the vine. To Christians, it reminds us of the blood Jesus shed on the cross for our sins, and it will cleanse us from our sins if we live and serve and obey and do your will. Help us as we partake, we always remember and the sacrifice that Christ made for us and the hope and promise that we have. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, good morning. I want to uh, thank you all for tuning in uh, virtually uh, for these uh, lessons. And I appreciate Monticello uh, inviting me. Uh, we uh, have uh, been able to uh, share many good memories in the past. And uh, I want to try to encourage you all uh, as much as possible by means of technology, of course. Hopefully, uh, in the near future, uh, Monticello Church Christ will be able to meet uh, in person soon. With that in mind, I want to talk about a very important uh, issue uh, in regards to our current cultural uh, attitudes today, and that is uh, the idea of Bible manhood. The Bible has a lot to say about manhood, and our cultural views today are uh, certainly crossways of what the Bible teaches. I have a quote that I'd like to share with you uh, from a man named John Wayne. Some of you, uh, maybe some of you older folks, uh, remember uh, the great Western hero and actor John Wayne. He said, I define manhood simply. Men should be tough, fair, and courageous, never petty, never looking for a fight, but never backing down from one either. And so there's an attitude of, of courage, the kind of attitude that, that men should have. And so if there was ever a lesson that was needed in this day and age, it's a lesson on Bible manhood. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 10, teach that the position of men and women are similar to the structural rank within the Godhead. And so we live in an age of feminism, gender confusion, and identity disorders. Most have no idea what it means to truly be a man. And so we're going to look at the topic of manhood, Bible manhood, and answer the question, what does it mean to be a man? Well, we have to go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 to see where the roles fit in. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then if you look in chapter 2 in verse 18, the Bible says, then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now these verses, go, they take us back to the creation, back to the beginning. And what we see in, this, in this, these passages is that there are cultural considerations. First of all, our worldview affects our understanding of what manhood truly is. If our worldview is tainted, by what the world is teaching, then we're going to have a different worldview than what the Bible teaches. Manhood is undefined in our culture because many believe we're here by chance. Many believe that we're a product of an evolution, evolutionary chance, uh, that we're here uh, simply by accident. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that people have a purpose. Man has a purpose. And back in Genesis 1, verse 27, the Bible tells us that God created man. He was designed. He was uh, fashioned. And it, he was made in the image of God, which would exclude uh, animals. Mankind, people, were made in the image of God. And the Bible says in verse 27, male and female, he created them. So both males and females were created in the image of God. We have a purpose. And in chapter 2, verse 18, uh, God goes on to explain what man's purpose is and what woman's purpose is. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. The helper of man, of course, would be the woman. And so what is this help that man needs? Well, he needs help fulfilling God's will, doing the will of God, fulfilling the commands that God has given man and woman. And then the Bible says suitable for him at the end of verse 18, which means corresponding to or, uh, or being uh, complementary to. And so uh, the woman and man work together in order to get to heaven and accomplish God's will. But you know, another consideration of the biblical man is uh, this idea of progressive ideology. Now, progressive ideology is against traditional manhood. And many people today uh, have, have false ideas about what uh, manhood truly is and so they take that narrative and run with it. First Corinthians chapter one, or sorry, chapter eleven and verse three, tells us a, a structural rank uh, by which uh, man, woman, and God uh, are in. 
1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. So in these verses, this particular verse, verse 3, we learn that there is a structural rank, and in the home it is the man and then the woman. And the reason for that is the structural rank of the Godhead, the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And so many want man, manhood, the whole idea of manhood, eradicated. Um, they can't see the pros or the cons. Uh, people don't want to call boys and girls uh, he or she anymore. They want to call them uh, it or theirs or use uh, gender neutral pronouns. Uh, this is not appropriate. We need to acknowledge truth and we need to refute error. People today, uh, they like to uh, confuse being a man with being a brute, someone who is, uh, does not have any feelings, does not show emotion, someone who runs roughshod over others. Uh, and they don't realize that b biblical manhood is not about that. Uh, you know, people perpetuate the idea of this stereotype of, of a man who, you know, maybe come home from work and he doesn't really do anything and he just orders people around and, uh, you know, he's not very smart and uh, he doesn't really contribute much at all to the well-being of the home or society. And this is simply not the case. This is not what the Bible teaches that a man should be. And so they can't see the pros for the cons. Also, in the considerations of a biblical man, we understand that, that, that there is a type of behavior. There's a type of behavior uh, that is typical of manhood, and this is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Now we realize that not all men are going to be married. Some men are going to be single. But this is talking about the ideal. This is talking about the ideal that men should shoot for in their lives. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Now in this passage we see what a man's responsibility truly is. If a man is married, if a man is a husband, uh, if a man has a wife, and this, this person is married, they are to act in a way, in a loving way. The proof is that marriage is compared to Christ and his church, and the word Savior is used at the end of verse 23. Savior of the body, Savior of the church. So, what we see here is the comparison of marriage to Christ in the church. We see the husband as the head of the wife in the home, just as Christ is the head of the body, the church. And so what was Christ's actions to save the church? Well, he died for the church. He saved the church. He, he, he loved the church. He cherished the church. In the same way, a man uh, will, will lovingly protect his wife and will, will be a type of a protector and provider for his wife and not be a meathead like many people portray uh, manhood as uh, some type of a uh, someone a know nothing or a meathead not a feminized man uh, a man that doesn't want to uh, offend anybody a man that uh, is overly uh, emotional uh, someone like that who will not be assertive when he needs to be not that either but a true gentleman, that is what the Bible tells men to be, are true gentlemen, both in the home, in their society, in the church, uh, throughout uh, their culture, they need to be uh, gentlemen. Also, a consideration of the biblical man is uh, that they embrace the gender roles in God's word. And so often, uh, people don't embrace the roles that God has given them. And this is a, this is a sad uh, state of affairs for our world today. People don't embrace those roles uh, because they haven't been taught uh, what the Bible says. They've been taught what their culture says. Do you realize that our culture has a much louder uh, voice than, than the church does today? And uh, people don't listen to Bible preaching like they used to. People don't pay attention to what the Bible says. It's easier to turn on the TV or talk to one of your friends or uh, maybe go on the Internet and check the news, things like that. Your worldview, your ideology, your behavior, what you embrace should not be uh, should not be swayed by what your culture teaches. Because number one, your culture changes every day. The mantra, the accepted position, the things that the culture teach changes every day. 
And so we shouldn't be like that. And number two, more importantly, is that God and his will is not the center of what the culture is trying to do. They're anti-God. They're teaching against God. They don't want men to be men and women to be women. They want there to be this big neutral ground and where nobody really knows who they are or what they are. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 says, A woman shall not wear a man's clothes, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And so we see that the, the sex of a person is to be distinguished by the apparel. This is something that most people do not know about, do not understand, do not appreciate, and many do not care about. But the Bible takes a stand on this. Men should not wear women's clothes. Women should not wear men's clothes. And this is something, there's a reason for this. The reason is, is that God has given uh, people specific roles. Each gender, the two genders, are given the roles so that they might be able to facilitate the ongoing uh, production of the human race. So what we see here is we see many people today dressing as the opposite gender, and uh, they're, they're not fulfilling their true destiny that God has given them. The Bible teaches that men should be men, women should be women. And uh, we need to respect what God's word teaches. God prescribes the roles and they contradict what the world uh, has to say. We need to take a stand. We need to make a choice. Are we going to follow the, uh, the will of God or are we going to follow the whims of men? Many people are uh, they're scared of their culture. Uh, they're intimidated by their culture. They simply want to get along with others. And so they submit to an antithetical Bible worldview regarding what a man is and what a woman is. To the point where now we have gender neutral bathrooms and we have all of these gender neutral clothes and we have gender neutral parenting. All these different things which are inappropriate and an abomination to the Lord. Genesis 2 verse 24 says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. What part about verse 24 is gender, gender neutral? What part about it says, well, uh, someone who's gender neutral or has an identity problem should, uh, should marry someone who has another identity problem or a man should marry a man or a woman marry a woman. Where does the Bible say that homosexual marriage is acceptable? It doesn't. Neither does it say that cross-dressing is, is essential or, necess, or uh, is uh, something that's accepted. Neither does it say that uh, you know, changing the, the uh, sex of a person through surgery is accepted. But the Bible tells us that we have a specific person, a purpose in that we have a plan from God. We'll leave our parents as a man and the men will cleave to their wife and the two will become one flesh. Notice that the Bible authorizes and prescribes that a man and a woman will become one flesh. Then Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 9, what God has brought together, let not man separate. So God is the one that brings the marriage together. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 when God brought the woman to man. So we see from these verses the considerations of the biblical man. What does it mean to be a man? Let's look at the characteristics of the biblical man. First characteristic we see here is that a biblical man respects women. So often we see a bad apple. We see a case of someone who does not respect other people, does not respect women, does not treat women uh, with dignity. This is a tragedy. This is not what is right. Genesis chapter 2 verse 23 and the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So here, Adam, the first man, is talking about the fact that God fashioned uh, the woman out of a rib in his side. You go back to the previous verse. And so what we see here is that she was taken out of me. And so she is going to be called like me. She's going to be called not a man, she's going to be called a woman. Do we not love our own bodies as men? 
If you're a man, do you not love your own bodies? Do people not love their own bodies? Well, yes, we do. So if you take care of your body, you, you love your body, should you not also respect uh, the woman, uh, the, the person, either your wife or other women uh, who are also God's uh, 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 products of God's creation and are made in the image of God? Should we not also respect uh, women? So that is uh, the first characteristic of a biblical uh, man. We can also go to Job chapter 31, where we see where uh, the writer, uh, Job, uh, actually uh, talks about his own struggles uh, with being uh, morally pure. He says in chapter 31 and verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? And what is the portion of God from above or the heritage of the Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work iniquity? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? So here Job is making the point that he has made a, a promise to God that he will not lust after a woman. He will not lust after someone who doesn't belong to him. And so what we need to understand is that that is all part of respecting women. And we could even throw in the idea of violence toward women. This is an insult to God. So we need to value women God's way. If you're a man and you want to strive to be a biblical man, the first thing you need to do is respect women, all women. The second characteristic of a biblical man is, is that he controls his strength, controls his strength. And this is found in Titus 3 and verse 2. And here we, we learn that strength doesn't mean that I always get my way. People today, um, they have this, this uh, erroneous idea that, well, you know, it's my way or the highway. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Titus 3, 2 says uh, the, the goal of godly living is to malign no one and to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. So these are some of the, the things involved in being a godly man. Not being contentious, being gentle, showing consideration to all people. A lot of people think that they need to be in control in order to be a man, but you don't. You simply have to have uh, a correct view of what God wants you to be. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29, uh, 29 Jesus is teaching that uh, we need to come to him for the peace that we need in our lives. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. We can learn from the example of Christ on how to treat other people. Men, understand this, that you can help ease other people's burdens. You don't have to be in control all the time. And if you have uh, all this strength, allow God to channel that strength so that you can do some good. And so, again, the idea of this my way or the highway attitude does not fit uh, what God wants uh, in a Bible man. A third characteristic of the biblical man is that he embraces his emotions. Do we embrace our emotions? You know, for years we've heard that, oh, well, you know, if you're a man, you won't cry. You won't show your emotions. But how many times have we seen uh, people, uh, you know, be victorious and uh, fight for something that they believe. And they work so hard for it and they win the victory. And you see them shed tears of joy. Does not the Bible in, in Revelation chapter 21 uh, tell us that there'll be no more uh, tears, but there will be joy in heaven, tears of joy really. And so what we need to understand is that it's okay to embrace emotions. It's okay to show emotions. Uh, emotions are not just for women. John 11, verse 32, is an example of Christ where he's uh, coming to the aid of Mary and Martha who have just lost Lazarus. And Lazarus was very close to Jesus. They were good friends. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, the Bible says. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And so the Jews were saying, Behold how he loved him. And so we learn here that uh, God made us emotional beings by design. 
We were made that way, to, to feel emotion, to feel empathy, to feel regret, to feel a loss and sadness. When a loved one dies, we have every right to show our emotion, to shed a tear, to, uh, to ask for comfort from someone. And, you know, there's appropriate times that we need to show our emotions. We need to be willing to express our emotions. And so a biblical man will express his emotions when they're appropriate to other people. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 reminds us where it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all uh, things as we are yet without sin. Again, talking about Christ, showing us that he does sympathize with our weaknesses. John 11 shows us he sympathized with those who had lost loved ones. And he, he missed uh, Lazarus. Of course, Lazarus was later raised from the dead. But the point is, is that we need to embrace our emotions. A fourth characteristic of the biblical man is that he enjoys relationships. This goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now, in this particular passage, we learn of, of David and uh, his dealings with uh, a man named Jonathan. Now, a lot of people misunderstand uh, this passage, and they take it out of context, but that's not what we need to do. When we read the Bible, we need to read uh, and understand what the whole context is talking about. So let's go to 1 Samuel 18 and read the first five verses. Now, it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself, and Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So let's, let's talk a little bit, bit about uh, 1 Samuel 18. Now, Jonathan and David uh, kind of uh, perked Saul's jealousy. And we see here in this passage that David was a very close friend of Jonathan. Jonathan loved David. And so what we see here is this began the beginning this was the beginning of this jealousy that Saul had. And really, if you study the life of the Saul of the Old Testament, you'll see the life of someone who had a mental illness. But just because David and Jonathan uh, were close does not mean that they were gay, does not mean that they had an inappropriate uh, relationship or something like that. Um, they were close friends. And so the Bible says that they, were, uh, they trusted each other. They relied on each other. Despite all the antics that Saul was pulling and all the terrible things that he was doing, trying to kill David, uh, these two were close friends. Now, if you flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 1 and in verse 26, you will see that we also need to enjoy relationships. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 26 says this, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. This is David. You have been very, uh, very pleasant to me. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of a woman. Now, again, a lot of people will try to take these verses out of context and say, oh, well, they were in an affair. You know, um, David uh, had an inappropriate relationship with John or whatever. That's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the Bible never tells us that never says that they were involved in anything that was wrong. Uh, simply, the fact is, is that David cared for Jonathan. Jonathan cared for David. And should we not have close friendships like that? You know, the Bible tells us that we need to have close friendships and experiences with other men, not just with our wife, not just with our spouse, not just with our children, but also with other men. And if you think about Examples of this, you know, we think about going hunting together, fishing, and uh, maybe going to a seminar, or uh, maybe you have a close co-workers, uh, people at work that you talk to all the time. Uh, this is the idea of, 
of a, the souls that are knit together. And of course, ultimately, we think about the Lord's church and uh, Christians, brothers in Christ, who can talk to each other and confide in each other and uh, draw emotional support from each other. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 tells us, Two are better than one because they uh, have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his uh, companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. The writer of Ecclesiastes is making the point in these verses that, that cooperation and friendship are so necessary in order to be successful. Unity and friendship are so important uh, in this life. And so if the writer of Ecclesiastes recognizes this and promotes this, should we not as Christians also promote uh, enjoying healthy friendships uh, with people uh, just like you, uh, talking to the men in our audience. Should we not try to have healthy friendships with other men and uh, be able to confide, be able to talk, be able to, to discuss things like this? Certainly it wouldn't be appropriate to talk to uh, a woman about some of the things that men talk about, nor would it be appropriate for a woman to talk to uh, other men about things that she has on her heart and in her mind. So a characteristic of the biblical man, respect for women, controls your strength, embraces emotions, enjoys relationships, and number five, lovingly provides. How oftentimes in our world today, uh, people have decided that they're going to stop working, they're just going to stay home, or they're going to just not do anything at all. The Bible tells us that men have a responsibility, and this doesn't mean that a woman can't go out and provide for her family. Certainly she can. Certainly she, she can. But in Genesis 2.15, the Bible gives the main responsibility of providing for a household to the man in the home. Genesis 2.15 says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So man was given a purpose. Man wasn't just created, and woman wasn't just created just to sit there and enjoy God's beautiful creation. God gave man tasks to do. And followed up on those, no doubt, uh, certain detailed tasks. So uh, God wants man to be industrious and to fulfill the work that he wants him to do and to find an occupation. Go into the garden, cultivate it, and keep it. A lot of people today don't want to cultivate and keep a job. They, don't, they can't hold a job. They're not, they're not responsible. They don't show up on time. They don't work hard. They don't do the things that their boss tells them to do. They get fired, and before long, they're not working anywhere because, well, they're just not a very reliable person, not, not a reliable employee. Christian men and Christians in general should be the best employees that their bosses have. Christians should be the best employees that their bosses have. And here is an example in Genesis 2 about God's expectation of a man working and providing. Now, why is it that we're focusing on the men providing? Because the, the thing is, is that women at least have a tendency to stay home with the children. Now, not all women stay home with the children. Some women will have children and they'll go off and they'll work. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a woman going out and working to provide for her family, to supplement the income. The book uh, of Proverbs, chapter 31, talks about the, uh, this, the, the woman of Proverbs being someone industrious, going out and selling things and buying things and, and doing these different things. And so uh, certainly that wouldn't exclude women. But men have the responsibility of bringing home uh, a large amount of the prosperity. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 says this, then to Adam, God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, curses the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." So these verses in Genesis chapter 3 teach us right there at the beginning 
that Adam listened to his wife in the sense that the serpent tempted Eve with uh, fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman, she took of the fruit, so she was the first one to sin. But then instead of questioning that behavior, Adam just goes right along with it and also takes the fruit of the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. So what we see here is that the, the, uh, the curse that goes along with that is that it's going to be a lot harder to provide for your family. Verses 17, 18, and 19. And life is going to be very tough for you. It's not going to be, I'm going to do God's work and God's going to bless me. No, now it's going to be, Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to do God's work. And it's going to be toil and, and a lot of times miserable. And my body's going to wear out. And people aren't going to be very thankful for my sacrifices. And things are going to be really tough. And I might not get ahead. I might not have everything I want or everything I need. And uh, I'm going to be blessed in many ways, but I'm also going to have a very hard life. And that's because of sin. But you know what? God commands man to provide lovingly for his family. It's God's expectation that we work. It's God's expectation that we serve. It's God's expectation that we show compassion. Not only to our own families, but also to uh, our own household and to those whom we come in contact with. So it's not just about providing for our own family, but also if we have the opportunity, we need to help other people. The Bible talks about Christian generosity and giving to others as we've been prospered, helping other people. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, 1 Timothy, along with uh, the New Testament was written to Christians. And what we see here is that uh, men and providers should care and financially support uh, their families, their household. And if they don't, they deny the faith. They're, uh, they're basically grouped in with, with people that are atheists, people that uh, have rejected God. And so how important is it for the man of God to provide for the people of God, for his family, for his wife, for his children, or maybe his aged parents, maybe uh, his wife's aged parents. How important is it for him to provide and make enough so that he might be able to give back to the Lord's church and might be able to help others in need? You see what I'm saying? A man has a purpose, and he has been given uh, this purpose, the fifth one we're talking about, to lovingly provide for others. A sixth uh, characteristic of the Bible man is that he wisely leads wisely leads and of course we can go back and uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5 we were just there a few moments ago and understand that a husband has a responsibility and a duty and a privilege to be able to lead his family to God in Ephesians 5 verses 24 through 33 again we look at the comparison of uh, marriage a husband and a wife to Christ and the church and uh, the Bible goes on to say in verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands and everything. And then the Bible says, husbands, love your own wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So this is talking about a husband's responsibility to care for his wife. Notice what it says, just as Christ also loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Christ gave his affection and dedication to the church when he died on the cross. A husband should give his affection and dedication to his wife uh, in the home and in life. And so we learn here that the purpose then is to uh, understand that, that we need to be sacrificial in our marriage. We need to help uh, our, our spouses get to heaven. We need to encourage them. And, uh, and so here it concludes in verse uh, 33. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife. That's the man must love his own wife, even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So the twin responsibilities, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. What we see here is that it compares uh, the spouse to yourself. So if you're going to love yourself, then you're going to love your spouse. We need to be dedicated to our marriages. Men, be dedicated to your marriage. That is a biblical man. Wisely lead in your home. Ephesians 6 verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction and training 
of the Lord. That's the responsibility. Fathers, bring your children up in the training of the Lord. Teach them the Bible. Read the Bible to them. Be a good example to them. Uh, show them that you love your wife by treating her well. Treat her kindly. Uh, be affectionate and dedicated to her. Be a, a hardworking uh, leader and a provider. And so men uh, must, uh, must head their wives and their children and also must be a, a, a leader in the church. But also be a listener. Just as much as men are to be leaders, they're also to be listeners. We learn this from the book of uh, Exodus chapter 18. Now, if you remember, in Exodus 18, Moses had a problem. Moses was uh, taking on too much responsibility. Uh, he was uh, making all these different minor decisions. And Jethro comes to Moses, and Jethro gives him wise advice. Uh, Jethro says, you know what? You should just hear the, the, the big things and let uh, others that you've appointed here are the small things. So Moses listened to his father-in-law Jethro and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all of Israel, made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And they judged the people at all times. The difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. Then Moses bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went his way into his own land. So what we see here in this passage is that he sent off his father-in-law because he figured out what his father-in-law said. You need to prioritize things. You need to lead wisely. Men need to lead wisely in their homes and make wise decisions. You know where you get wisdom? You get it from God's word. And so men, we need to read God's word to make good and wise decisions in our marriages and in our homes and be able to do God's will. Last characteristic, number seven, uh, biblical man humbly repents. Sometimes we've done wrong. Sometimes maybe people uh, know about it, and sometimes people don't know about it. But you know what? Sometimes we do wrong, and we need to repent. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. The reason a lot of men today fall into sin, the reason a lot of men today have broken marriages, the reason that a lot of men today don't have respect in their homes or in the communities is because a lot of men are prideful. They think that, that uh, well, they think they're perfect or they think they're good enough or they think, well, maybe I'm not perfect, but you know what? I'm good enough for me and I don't need to get any better. I, I'm, I'm as good as I'm going to be. I don't need to grow up anymore. I don't need to learn anymore. Uh, I'm getting along just fine. But you know, humility is something that every Christian should do, especially those that are in sin. They need to repent. Men can show godly character by admitting their mistakes to gain credibility. The quickest way to gain credibility in your home and in the church and at work and in society is to admit when you've done wrong, to admit when you've made a mistake. And, you know, a lot of people like to use the phrase, well, I'm only human. Well, I think that that's usually used as a cop-out. But the point is, is that we need to try to do what is right. And when we do make a mistake, we need to take responsibility for it. And we need to pledge that, you know what, we're not going to do that again. And we're going to uh, get help from other people to hold us accountable. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 tells us, Humble yourselves, uh, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. So we need to humble ourselves. And do what is right. So we've looked at the conditions, the, con the considerations and characteristics of the biblical man. Now if we go back to 1 Corinthians to wrap this lesson up in verse uh, chapter 16 and in verse 13. Here's what we read. Paul was encouraging the church of Corinth. And in so doing that, he tells men how to act. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And the, the word there for uh, the phrase, act like men, is roughly translated uh, bravery. Men need to be brave. Men have been given a lot of responsibility. They've been given a lot of obligations to fulfill by God's word. Rather than take the easy route and just reject it all and not do anything, men need to be brave and, and, and own up to their responsibilities 
in the home, in their marriage, in, in the church, uh, in the society, at work, maybe they're in school, wherever they are, men need to own up to their responsibilities. We're living in a day when true masculinity is needed more than ever. Men need to be men. Our world needs strong, wise, loving, and humble leaders who will provide for others and do what it takes. Reject the progressive calls for manhood and embrace God's ways. Reject the world and obey the gospel today. The greatest thing that a man can ever do is obey the gospel. By believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as Lord, and being baptized in Christ for forgiveness of sins, you can become not just a good man, you can become a Bible man, you can become a saved man. Maybe you're uh, someone, maybe you're a, a woman, you're listening to this message thinking, well, what can I do? Well, you can encourage your man. You can encourage the men in your life uh, to study the Bibles, to pray, to do what is right. If you need to become a Christian, we've explained what you need to do to be saved. You can contact any one of the people here at Monticello Church of Christ, and they will assist you uh, in your desire to become a Christian, or maybe you have prayers or concerns. Maybe you'd like a Bible study. You can contact the great people here at Monticello Church of Christ as well. Um, I've enjoyed speaking to you uh, this morning. I hope that you've been edified by this lesson. I want you to uh, tune in next Sunday where we're going to be delivering a lesson on Bible womanhood. I hope you'll uh, be with us then and be encouraged by that lesson. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great week. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee now at the end of this morning's service, we're so thankful for all of life's many blessings. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunities that we've had to be able to come together each week and, and record our lessons and to share them online. We pray, Father, that uh, this has been pleasing to You and in accordance with Thy will. We're thankful for Brother Jacob and the lesson that he presented here this morning. We pray, Father, that we'll be able to take, take what we have learned and apply it to our daily lives to become better Christians towards Thee. We pray for those who are mentioned as sick, especially for those who, whose lives have been impacted by COVID. We pray, Father, that You will be with them and comfort and heal them as only You can. Watch over us as we go throughout this week and forgive us of all our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.